Today's episode of A New Beginning is brought to you by Harvest Partners, helping people everywhere know God. Learn more at harvest.org. And while you're there, browse our library of free ebooks designed to help you grow in your faith. Antichrist is coming to dominate the globe. He will be a satanic superman. It'll be a time when evil is unleashed with supernatural fury. But that's not the whole story. Coming up today, Pastor Greg Laurie points out the flip side. Antichrist is coming. That's the bad news. Good news. Jesus Christ is coming before the Antichrist. Therefore, we should not be looking for Antichrist. We should be looking for Jesus Christ. This is the day when the lost are found. This is the day for a new beginning. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Again, you hear all the angels are singing. This is the day, the day when life begins. For many, the Antichrist is a man shrouded in mystery. How could he be adored by so many and then soon bring death and destruction upon the planet? He'll bring a divided world together and then tear it apart. How can that be? Today on A New Beginning, Pastor Greg Laurie gives us a detailed view of this man of sin, this son of perdition, from the clear vantage point of Scripture. Pastor Greg clears up the mystery and solidifies our hope in the soon return of Christ. Today we're back in our Daniel series that we're calling End of Days. And I'm going to ask you to turn to two passages, Daniel chapter 7 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And the title of my message is Antichrist, America, and the End of Days. Let's talk about the Antichrist himself. He will be sent by Satan. If the devil ever had a son, this will be him. The Antichrist will be energized by Lucifer himself. But he's not going to be what you might expect, you know, dressed head to toe in black with glowing red eyes and steam coming off of him with a Darth Vader song playing in the background when he enters a room. No, I'm telling you, this guy will be charismatic. He'll be magnetic. He'll be a powerful orator. He'll be a convincing speaker. He will do what no man has ever been able to do before. He will establish a treaty between the Jewish and Arab nations that they will abide by and he will pave the way for the long awaited third temple in Jerusalem. He will be a satanic superman. But it's all a mask hiding who he really is, the most evil man who ever lived. Daniel 7 verse 8, I was considering the horns and there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots and there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking pompous words. We'll stop there. So if you're taking notes, here's point number one. Antichrist is coming to defy and take the place of Jesus. Antichrist is coming to defy and take the place of Jesus. A horn, as mentioned here in Daniel 7, 8, is a symbol of power in Scripture. But this horn has both eyes and a mouth, reminding us that this is a person that is being addressed. And I would also add this. The prefix anti does not only mean against, it also means instead of. So it's not just that this coming world leader, this beast, this charismatic politician extraordinaire is going to oppose Christ, and he will, but he also comes in the place of Christ. And for some, they'll believe he is the Christ, or he is their Messiah at least. But here's something else to know about Antichrist. Point number two, he is coming to declare war on believers. He's coming to declare war on believers. Daniel uh, 7.25 says, Then the saints will be given into his hand for time and times and half. Okay? So we'll read this phrase in Daniel and elsewhere. And basically it comes down to this. The Antichrist will inaugurate what is often called the Great Tribulation Period that will last for seven years. In the beginning of the tribulation, the Antichrist will come off like a good guy. 
He'll come with His peace treaty. He'll come with His brilliant words. He'll come with economic solutions. And many will hail Him and love Him. And especially when He rebuilds the third temple for the Jewish people. But at the three and a half year mark, the abomination of desolation takes place. And we'll talk about this more later too. But this is when the temple is rebuilt and it's desecrated by the Antichrist, marking the second section of the tribulation period where this coming world leader shows his true colors. And they're not pretty. He begins to persecute Jewish people and he persecutes Christians and he begins to rule by force. And so that is what this is referring to. Number three, Antichrist is coming to dominate the globe. He's coming to dominate the globe. Revelation 13, 7 says, authority was given to him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. Now again, I want to emphasize, how does he do it? Through war? No, initially through peace. The Bible says through peace he will deceive many. And so he'll establish peace, but then he'll be the ultimate man of war following that. Now here's another interesting thing about him. Number four, Antichrist will establish global control through a cashless society. Antichrist will establish global control through a cashless society, requiring people to take a mark, and no one will be able to buy or sell without the mark under the reign of Antichrist. Now I ask you, is this possible in technology today? Well of course it is. We all know it is. So you know, some of you are thinking, well this is like the most depressing message I've ever heard. <laughs> okay, now let me pivot, change my direction. Antichrist is coming. That's the bad news. Good news. Jesus Christ is coming before the Antichrist. Therefore, we should not be looking for Antichrist. We should be looking for Jesus Christ. Don't waste your time trying to figure out who the Antichrist is. You say, well, I don't understand. What do you mean Jesus Christ is coming? I mean He's coming. He's coming back for His people. In fact, I don't even believe the Antichrist can be revealed until Christ comes for His people and what we call the rapture of the church. And I'll define that in a moment. But over in 2 Thessalonians 2, 7 it says, the mystery of lawlessness is already at work and now he who restrains will continue to do so until he is taken out of the way. So the Bible says, and then that wicked one will be revealed whom the Lord will destroy with the brightness of his coming. So let me simplify that. The Bible saying before Antichrist can be revealed, the restraining force, the thing that's holding him back, has to be removed. So what is the restraining force in the world today that keeps evil from spreading wholesale? It's Christians. It's Christians who stand up for what is true. Christians who speak out against what is wrong. Christians who make such a difference in every situation. Imagine if we were all suddenly just removed from the planet. You could see how all hell could literally break loose. So the restraining force is the work of the Holy Spirit through the church. Once the church is removed or caught up to heaven, I don't mean buildings, I mean people. Once we're caught up to heaven, Antichrist can begin his reign. You say, now you mentioned the word rapture. You know, I don't know that I've ever seen the word rapture in the Bible. Well, okay. And I, I know some people are critical of the rapture. The rapture is not in the Bible. Show me the word rapture. Okay, I'll show you the word rapture when you show me the word trinity in the Bible. How about this? I'll show you the word rapture when you show me the word Bible in the Bible. The word Bible is not in the Bible. Did you know that? But we use that phrase. So you say, well, what does it deal with the rapture? The teaching of the rapture is clearly in the Bible many times. In fact, it's used 13 times in the New Testament. The word rapture is just a translation of a Latin word rapturus. So if you have a Latin translation, you have the word rapturus. Okay? But the Greek word is harpazo. Harpazo. So don't get hung up on the word rapture. I'm just saying that there is an event coming. Call it the rapture. Call it the harpazo. Call it the great escape. Whatever you like. But it is a teaching that people are going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. The word harpazo can be translated to take forcibly, to snatch, or to catch up. 
The rapture is when Christ descends from heaven and we're caught up to meet Him. Now, could we be the generation that sees the rapture? Yes. Are we the generation that will see the rapture? I don't know. I don't know. No one knows. And by the way, no one knows the day of the hour. And every now and then someone comes along, I figured it out. I cracked the code after eating a lot of Cheetos and drinking Diet Coke. <laughs> and here's the date. I already know they're wrong. Because when Jesus says no one knows the day of the hour, the return of the Son of Man, if you were to go back to the original language, it would translate no one knows the day of the hour. And what it means is no one knows the day of the hour. So we should avoid date setting at all costs. Pastor Greg Laurie will have the second half of his message in just a moment. Hey everybody, what are you doing this weekend? I'd like to hang out with you at Harvest at Home. What is Harvest at Home? It is a time of worship and Bible study exclusively designed for people that are viewing in from all over the place. So you can be a part of our extended congregation at Harvest at Home. Join us this weekend, Saturday and Sunday for Harvest at Home at harvest.org. Well, we're considering the biblical facts surrounding the Antichrist today and how the rapture may hasten our exit before the man of lawlessness even arises. Here's Pastor Greg once again. So we're caught up to meet the Lord in the air, and it's at that moment that we receive our new resurrection bodies. And it's also at that moment that we're reunited with loved ones who have preceded us. Bringing me to point number two, why is there a rapture? Listen to this now. Why is there a rapture? Well, back in Thessalonica, there were a lot of Christians. And many of them had died. Some from natural causes. Some had been martyred for their faith. So there was a concern among the Thessalonian Christians that they would never see their loved ones who had preceded them to heaven. And they wondered if they would miss the rapture. And so Paul writes these words. First Thessalonians 4.13 We don't want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who have died so that you will not grieve as those who have no hope. See, I bring this up because sometimes people say there's no point in studying Bible prophecy. No one can understand it. There's a lot of views. Don't study it. No, we need to study Bible prophecy because if we understand it, it will impact us in the way that we live. And I find great hope from this teaching of the rapture. So I don't have to grieve hopelessly. Listen, Christians grieve. But we grieve hopefully, not hopelessly. Because we know we'll see our loved ones again who've gone to heaven. We'll either see them through death. When we die, we'll see them in glory. Or we'll see them in the rapture. So imagine this, those of you who have lost loved ones, You could be just going about your business one day and uh, suddenly, in a moment so quick you can't measure it, the Bible says the rapture will happen in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. That's pretty fast, isn't it? Twinkling of an eye? It's faster than the blink of an eye. Let's all blink our eyes. One, two, three. Blink. It's faster than that. (laughs) That's fast. Try to imagine it. I don't think you can wrap your mind around it. You're just walking along. Maybe you're even thinking about your loved one, how much you miss them, how much you wish you could be with them. All of a sudden, boom, you're with them. It's a rapture. Boom, you're there. Reunited with them. The dead in Christ rise first, which means when you die as a Christian, you go to heaven, and we which are alive and remaining shall be caught up together with them who, those who have preceded us, will be caught up together with them in the clouds, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And then Paul says, therefore comfort one another with these words. See, that's the practical side of this teaching. There's no theology without doxology. And that simply means it's great to study doctrine and it's great to study scripture. But what does it mean to me in real life? And that's what it means to you. It means you'll see them again. And that is a great hope that we have as followers of Jesus Christ. Caught up in a moment in the twinkling of an eye to meet them and to meet the Lord. So the rapture is going to come. And sometimes people get confused about the rapture and the second coming. By the way, there are two events. And they're separated by seven years. 
Now you want to talk about date setting. I'll tell you when the second coming of Christ is. You want to know? Very simple. It's at the end of the tribulation period. It's uh, during the battle of Armageddon. Well, when's that? I don't know. But I just know once the church is raptured and Antichrist is revealed, you can do the math and go forward seven years and that's when Christ is going to come back at the second coming. But here's the difference. In the rapture, He comes for His church. and the second coming, He comes with His church. In the rapture, He comes as a thief in the night. And in the second coming, every eye will see Him. Jesus said, as the lightning shines from the east to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. So let's conclude. We've talked about Antichrist. Now let me ask you a question that may surprise you. Are you Antichrist? What? Are you saying I could be the Antichrist? No, I didn't ask you that. There's a difference between the Antichrist, the beast, and being Antichrist. That term is used of those who've turned against Jesus and away from the church. First John 2.18 says, Dear children, the last hour is here. And you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, and already many such Antichrists have appeared. From this we know that the end of the world has come. These people left our churches because they never really belonged with us. Otherwise they would have stayed with us. And when they left us, it proved they did not belong with us. Remember, anti-Christ. Anti doesn't just mean against. It means instead of. Now there can be someone here listening to me or wherever they're watching or hearing this later. And they'll say, well, I'm against Jesus Christ and I'm against Christians and I'm against the Bible. Okay, man, you are anti-Christ. You are. But then there can be someone that would say, well, it's not that I'm against Christians. It's just that I have other things in the place of God in my life. It's not that I don't care about God, but I care more about my career, or I care more about my vice, or I care more about my money, or I care more about this relationship. Do you realize that can be a form of anti because it's instead of Christ? And these people were in our church and they left our church and they never came back proving they were never part of us. So what about people that come to church and you see them for weeks, months, maybe years and they seem to be a passionate Christian. Then one day they just walk away. Ah, I don't believe in that anymore. I'm not into it. And they never come back to the Lord again. Did they lose their salvation? I would suggest to you maybe they never had salvation. Here's how you know if you're a real Christian. It's where you end up. Christians have lapses of faith. Christians have doubts. Christians fall short and Christians backslide. But if they're real believers, they'll always come home again. They'll always return to the Lord again. But if they never return to the Lord again, I suggest to you they were never Christians to begin with. And in effect, in a strict biblical definition, they're anti-Christ. You do not want to be that person. So let me ask in closing, are you anti-Christ or are you for Christ? Those are your only options. And before you is death and life and heaven and hell. You decide what you'll be. Rapture, it's coming, could come in your lifetime, could come this year, could come this month, could come today. Nothing's standing in the way of it. So I ask you now, are you rapture ready? You say, how do you know if you're rapture ready? Well, here's what you need to do. You need to admit you're a sinner. You need to turn from your sin. You need to ask Christ to come into your life and forgive you of your sin. Oh, so you're basically saying you need to be a Christian. Bingo. <laughs> See, if you're a Christian, you've got all of your bases covered. If you're a Christian, it's win, 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 right? So if I die, I go to heaven. If the rapture comes, I'm taken to be with the Lord. I have purpose in this life and hope for the life to come. That's our hope. So that's how you know you're rapture ready, by having Jesus live inside of you. Listen to this. When Jesus comes back for His people, not everybody is going to be caught up to meet Him in heaven. Only believers will. There will be people who are left. You don't want to be that person. So if you're not sure if you're ready for the return of the Lord, if you're not confident that you would go to heaven if you were to die today, why don't you respond to this invitation and ask Jesus Christ to come into your life. He'll forgive you of all of your sin and you don't have to be afraid of any of the things we've been talking about. 
You don't have to be afraid of Antichrist or the tribulation period or hell or any of that because you have hope in Christ and you have the promise of spending eternity with Him. If you're not sure of this, let's get this resolved right here, right now. Let's all pray together. Father, thank you for your word to us. Thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross in our place and to rise again from the dead. Now I pray for any that have joined us who do not yet know you. Lord, help them to see their need for you. Help them to come to you and believe in you now. In your name we pray. Amen. And if you'd like to do as Pastor Greg Laurie suggested and get rapture ready, he'll come back in just a moment to lead you in doing that. So stay tuned. It's too important to tune away. And then we're so excited about making a new DVD available to you. It's a look at the colorful history of contemporary Christian music, featuring interviews with those who played a key part. The DVD is called The Jesus Music. It features Amy Grant. But a lot of hymns are close your eyes singing to God. I wanted to sing songs with my eyes wide open singing to each other. Michael W. Smith. When I first heard that Maranatha record, I just couldn't get enough of it. It was called the Everlasting Living Jesus Music Concert, or Maranatha One. It broke new ground back in 1971. This thing called Jesus Music, which exploded in Southern California, somehow found its way in my hometown. And it changed my life. So this is a new movie produced by the Irwin Brothers, who, by the way, are also producing the brand new film that will come out next year based on my life and the last great spiritual awakening in America that will be called Jesus Revolution. So the Jesus Music is a special documentary film that tells the story of how this music came to be. I mean, it's an industry now. In fact, we call it contemporary Christian music, but it did not start out as an industry. It started out as a movement. It started out as an expression of faith. One of the unique features of the early Christian songs, which were happening back in the 70s, is they were proclaiming the gospel to the culture. So it wasn't really designed to be our own music as much as it was designed to be our message brought to the culture around us. Well, a lot has changed since then, and now we have categories of it and and different versions of it, and I think that's all great. But if you want to see the big picture and how this all started, and if you want to see great artists talk about how they produce and create this incredible music we enjoy so much, then you will want to order your own copy of The Jesus Music. It's available on DVD, Blu-ray, and you can also download it. There'll be a special code provided with the DVD we send you, and you can watch it on your phone, on your tablet, on your computer, or maybe even on your big screen TV. So this is something that I think you'll all love to have. It's entertaining. It's fun. It's insightful, and it also gives us a history of what God did and a sense of what God still wants to do in our future. So order your copy of The Jesus Music for your gift of any size to our ministry. Whatever you send, we will put it to good use to continue to preach the gospel and teach the Word of God. Yeah, that's right. It's a great investment, an eternal investment. You know, we saw more than 1,700 people make professions of faith at Boise Harvest a few weeks ago, more than 1,500 more by people watching online. Your investment helps us reach out with the gospel through those outreaches and through our daily outreach here on A New Beginning. And when you give, we'll thank you with this new film called The Jesus Music. It'll come to you on DVD, Blu-ray, and in downloadable form. So contact us today. Our 24-hour phone number is 1-800-821-3300. That's 1-800-821-3300. Or write A New Beginning, Box 4000, Riverside, California, 92514. Or go online to harvest.org. Well, Pastor Greg, you mentioned our need to come to Christ for forgiveness of sin in today's study. Right. Maybe there's somebody listening who'd like to do that, that'd like to take that step. 
Maybe you could help them with that right now. I'd be delighted to. Listen, if you would like to accept Jesus Christ into your life right now, and by that I mean if you would like your sin forgiven and have the assurance that you will go to heaven when you die, would you pray this prayer with me? Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner, but I thank you for dying on the cross for my sin and rising again from the dead. I'm sorry for my sin, Lord, and I turn from it now, and I put my faith in you to be my Savior, my Lord, my God, and my friend. Thank you for loving me and calling me and accepting me. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Listen, if you just prayed that prayer in a minute, I want you to know on the authority of God's Word that Jesus Christ has just come to take residence in your heart. The Bible says these things we write to you that believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. Listen, we want to send you some resources that will help you grow spiritually. So here's Dave with some details. And let me say, God bless you and welcome to the family of God. Yeah, and those resources Pastor Greg mentioned are all included in something we call our New Believers Growth Packet. It'll help you get started in living your life for the Lord. So can we send it to you? Just ask for the New Believers Growth Packet. Our phone number is 1-800-821-3300. Call any time, 1-800-821-3300. Or write A New Beginning, Box 4000, Riverside, California, 92514. Or go online to harvest.org and click the words, Know God. Well, next time, Pastor Gray continues his series from Daniel called End of Days with a message called Three of the Hardest Words to Say. Join us here on A New Beginning with pastor and Bible teacher Greg Laurie. A New Beginning is a podcast made possible by Harvest Partners, helping people everywhere know God. If this show has impacted your life, share your story, leave a review on your favorite podcast app, and help others find hope.